thank you for the, the good introduction. Um, I want to turn around, turn back around, and, and thank Randy for uh, and a couple of other folks for reviewing my slides ahead of time, and uh, also all the folks on the the Club 100 mailing list. Um, basically, I this 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 didn't spring forth from my consciousness. It's all stuff I've absorbed, all stuff I've uh, just learned from working on, I don't know, maybe half a dozen machines now. So just jump right in the, the background on the, the Model 100. Uh, it was released in 1983. Uh, it's a TRS-80 in name only. They just reused the branding. It's got absolutely nothing to do with uh, software, hardware-wise, with any of the other TRS-80 branded stuff. Um, it was uh, advertised as the micro-executive workstation. Um, I say later, it might have actually been advertised that way from the beginning. Um, but they clearly had uh, a target market Fletcher, I don't need that report tomorrow. Great, JT. I need it tonight. But JT... Fletcher saved $300 on her office away from the office. Radio Shack's revolutionary Model 100 computer. It's a word processor, phone directory, and dialer. It even communicates with the office computer. Fletcher, how's that report? Fletcher. Radio Shack's Model 100. Save $300 and put it to work. You'll go far, Fletcher. <laughs> You'll go far. So, you know, 1980s uh, sexual stereotypes aside, that's clearly what they were going for w w with this machine. And it seems to have really uh, hit the market fairly well. It was, it was popular based on the number of machines that you can find still in circulation. They sold plenty of them. And uh, they're, they're fun little machines. Uh, now, as is typical with Radio Shack, it was not designed by them. Uh, not unlike the TRS-80, where they designed the stuff in-house, came up with their own. This was just pulled right off the shelf from Kyocera. Now, they customized it. They had uh, software changes, and I think that, I think it's basically software, because I think the hardware here is, is fairly similar between, the, so this is the, the Qtronic 85, which uh, Kyocera sold themselves. And then they, they also licensed the design to uh, NEC and Olivetti. Of them, I believe, uh, Kyocera actually, Kyocera and NEC were the only ones who actually manufactured them. I think uh, Kyocera was, was the original equipment manufacturer for the Radio Shack unit, although I haven't been able to confirm that anywhere. Does anyone know for sure? Yeah. Uh, so uh, looking into other variants, the NEC, they released the PC-8201A and later then the PC-8300. Uh, they had a lot more expandability. Uh, they actually had, if you look uh, on this side, would have been a, a sidecar module for it that you could attach other uh, peripherals to it. it. It came with the capability on board of having uh, two memory banks. And the second memory bank could actually be write protected with a hardware switch. Uh, so you could have you know, software loaded into memory there that was you know, immutable other than you know, loss of all your memory. And the, the ROM also supported X modem file transfer out, out of the box. The, the Olivetti, of course, you know, it's Olivetti. It has to be an absolutely gorgeous, beautiful machine. But the main distinguishing factor there was the flip-up uh, LCD screen. This, this piece right here would actually just flip uh, at, an, at an angle so you could adjust it for nice, comfortable viewing. Uh, came in different keyboards, uh, uh, American and European. Then later on, Tandy would introduce the 102. That was a cost-reduced version. It was thinner by about a half an inch, lighter by not quite a pound, I think. And the big difference there is it was built with surface mount technology. If you look at the board, PC boards between the two, very, very different part set. The, this this jam-packed board on the Model 100 has been replaced with so much extra board space because of the, the surface mount. Uh, everything's miniaturized inside the 102. And then they also released the Model 200 uh, with a, in a clamshell form factor. I'll have all these machines on display uh, Saturday and Sunday at my booth. And the, this was a fairly big change, uh, both in terms of the ROM software. The, the ROM software between the 100 and the 102, I think, is almost identical except for a few bug fixes. The 200 software is quite a bit different. A lot of that's because of the different memory map. And the difference in the memory map is because they included Microsoft Multiplan in the built-in ROM. 
So whereas the, the 100, 102 were capable of going up to 32K of ROM, uh, sorry, RAM, the 200 only accommodated 24K of RAM because of that extra space used by multiplan. But for that trade-off, you would get a machine, the 200 is, is bank switchable, so you could have up to three banks of 24K. Now, not all usable at the same time. It's basically like having three machines in one. You could switch, switch to the other bank, and this is the same with the, the NEC, the multi-banks. You just have different files in the three banks, so it's like carrying three different machines worth of contents. Um, so this is, uh, all right, yes, the software. Um, it is absolutely true that this is the last major project that Bill Gates himself wrote most of the code for. Most of the ROM code on these things was, was written by Billy G. And the main ROM code, of course, consists of basic, and it's Microsoft's floating point basic. A text editor, I won't call it a word processor, it's really a fairly bare bones text editor. Uh, telecom modem program, and then the address and schedule programs, which are sort of like flat file database programs that worked off of text files that you would write in text to input the data, and then these programs would just display and access and sort the data separately. Uh, I'm not a fan. <laughs> <laughs> but, all right, so this, and this is what the menu screen would look like on a 32K model 100 or model 102. You have basic there, it's the default application that gets selected. And this is, this is what it'll look like, you know, 28 seconds after a cold start. Uh, displaying uh, time and date, not Y2K compatible, and then the basic text telecom programs. All these extra slots right here, these, these dash dot dashes, those are uh, empty slots for other files that would be displayed, you know, if you created text files or loaded other programs onto the machine. And it uses a 6.2 file naming convention. And the extensions on this, in this ROM are very, very, very important because of how it organizes the different types of files within the memory map. I'll get into that later. There's a lot of problems people have using these machines, and it's simply because you tried to load a file with the wrong extension, and guess what? Your machine melted down on you. Plenty of good connectivity on these things. Uh, RS-232 serial port, printer port. You can connect to parallel Centronics cable for this. Cassette port, a built-in 300 baud modem. This was very popular with journalists for that reason. Uh, barcode reader, you could uh, do industrial automation applications. I think um, there was, the barcode, the barcode wand itself was sold, I believe, with a cassette. It had a couple of different decoder programs on it for different types of barcodes. And you would load those decoders into memory and then you could write basic programs that would read data off of that by opening the wand device. And that hooked into the, the machine language program that you loaded off of cassette, which would actually do the decoding. Uh, DC coax jack, center negative. And this is what your architecture looks like. So the RAM is split up into eight kilobyte banks, or eight kilobyte segments. Uh, the ROM, main ROM here, the option ROM here. Now these two are actually mapped into the same space. I'll show you that in the, the memory map a little bit later. So all the other stuff on the, on the bus, the, the 8155 PIO handles most of your peripherals, uh, LCD controllers, those are off on the LCD PCB, uh, Intersil, IM6402 UART, and that handled both the RS-232 and the modem interface via a multiplexer. Um, and by the way, feel free to interrupt me with questions. I'm just going to sort of go through this at my usual I'm nervous breakneck speed. So please, please interrupt. Do you know why they uh, select an 8085 versus a C80? Um, yes, I do. And it's because of this right there, right? This, this, this full CMOS implementation that drew 10 milliamps and also being sort of like uh, 8080 machine set instructional, but requiring way less support chips. Um, but keep in mind, this was not chosen by Radio Shack. This was chosen by Kyocera. So they had no input at all from the TRS-AD design. 
It was just, hey, this, this is a cool chip that Intel makes that we can make an awesome portable out of. So that's, that's, why, the, that's why they chose the 8085s, because it's, it's the thing that enabled this thing to be small, lightweight, and battery powered. You stick four AA's in this thing, you're good for 16 to 20 hours. The, as far as I know, what was sold here was exclusively Tandy, and it was designed with their designed with their input, which mostly I think had to do with the software configuration, because the software is, I believe, slightly different between the the 100, 102, and like the the, Q, the KC eighty um, five. They, I don't believe they made a lot of customization to the hardware, maybe just placement of ports. There, I've not been able to dig up a lot of history on the design and the genesis of the 100-102. I, I tried to do some research and I found basically diddly squat. And what I, what I know, I sort of had to deduce from what I read about the NEC. All right, um, the option ROM, this is a picture of the option ROM socket here. It's not showing off, not showing up particularly well. But this is available under a, a little trap door on the bottom. And so you can just pull this guy off and you have access to the system bus port and the option ROM socket. So you could, would go into Radio Shack or probably more likely mail order a piece of software, software package on this. You go in, the sales associate would pop the machine open and install the software in here and type a little in its sequence and boom, boom, you had software. There were also third parties who made a lot of different software for this. And then there were, as far as I can tell, a small but significant number of uh, vertical integration markets that had custom software for these things because you would find these machines embedded in a lot of other stuff like um, data collection, systems automation, um, applications like that. There, I've, I found an article from a reporter who used one of these and it confirms that the AP actually had their own ROM software that they used on this when they issued it to their, to their field reporters and it interfaced with their backend uh, mainframe. There's, there, there seems to be a lot of like rumors around these machines, like the rumor about it being Bill Gates' project and the rumor about journalists loving it, that people like to try and dispel these rumors. And as far as I can tell, they're all true. The reporters actually did love them. The keyboard on them is great. You can find double A's anywhere in the world. Uh, so, But there was, there was plenty of other third-party software for it. And it came on these little option ROM modules that was basically a, a, custom, a chip with a custom wiring diagram in a little plastic Molex carrier that you snap into that, into that socket there. The system bus connector, this is the raw 40 pin 8085 system bus. And you just get access to it on a little insulation displacement connector. It was used by the uh, DVI, the disk video interface. And so you would connect it to this and that, the cable runs back to the DVI. And the DVI is a cool little box. It gives you uh, up to two five and a quarter inch floppy drives, composite video out for 80 column text. So it's kind of like a docking station for your Model 100. It didn't add any extra RAM. Uh, the disks still held you know, a, a piddly amount, like 200 kilobytes. But still, it was, it was something. I have no... $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $500. $
So that's really responsible for a lot of the wonderful battery life on this, is that it can really suck all the power out of those things. It, even, even when your power out of your AA's goes below, one, goes below five volts, it'll continue running. And it had software power control. So it would shut itself off after 15 minutes, or you could even shut it off in software by just issuing the power off command. So it's a very advanced system for its time. Like I said, the 80, 8155 PIO drives all those different peripherals. The 6402 UART, that drove both the modem and the RS-232. The cassette port was driven straight off the 8085. That did not involve the UART. <clears throat> Barcode reader, the LCD display is driven by 10 of these Hitachi uh, video controllers. Each one drives a little rectangular section of the screen, roughly 50 by 32 pixels, although you'll notice that doesn't divide evenly into the number of pixels on the machine. And the, the right two most LCD chips don't have all of their lines used. All right, the, I said I would mention the memory map. Here we start to get into it. So this is the standard address space here uh, for the, the ROM, the standard ROM and the option ROM, bank switch between them. And then originally when the system was sold, it was sold in an 8K base configuration and expandable up to 32K. So most of the documentation refers to the standard RAM and then three option RAM slots. Now later on, RAM prices would drop, application sizes would increase, people demanded more memory, and they stopped selling the 8K configuration. And by the end of it, they were only selling the 24K configuration or the 32. So you would find, you'll find machines where only this one is soldered, and you'll find machines where the whole bottom three are soldered. It depends on the version of the motherboard. I, I can show you ones with both. So the RAM started at E000, so from 8000, DFFF was just, just blank, huh? Yeah, so, so what would happen in this configuration, the, the top of RAM, which is always shown at the bottom of their diagrams, is, is where your RAM starts, and then the bottom of your address space, bottom half of it was taken up by the ROM. And then you would add RAM moving down in the address space. Um, and the address, this is important because of how it lays out the memory. So the, the lower half of the RAM stores different segments for your basic files, your document files, machine language, uh, executables, CO files, then basic variables, basic arrays. This, is, this winds up being where your free user RAM is then your stack. Um, not actually sure what it means by user programs now that I'm looking at it. And then system variables. Um, but what would happen is different system variables here would store pointers to the beginning of these different regions. So that's how it knew how to process all the different types of information. The result being what usually happens, and this happens to pretty much every new person who tries to use one of these machines, is they find a piece of basic software that they want to load on here, and it's stored on the PC disk or from the internet, something.ba, when it is in fact ASCII basic source. It is not tokenized basic files, which is what live up here. And they try to load it in. They load it in as something.ba. It goes into the tokenized basic region, and the tokenizer goes <laughs> and your machine reboots and loses all your files. This memory map is very, very, very unforgiving. So that's, that's why I want to make this point right here. When you're using these machines, be careful about the extensions of your files. They really do matter. <laughs> this is a, a look across the PC board. On the upper left, there's the section for the modem and the cassette interface. This little barrel battery here is your memory backup battery, uh, PIO. UART, CPU, right there in a nice line. And this one, you, you may or may not be able to make this out from this picture, but this one has three soldered RAM chips with the fourth one being socketed. This was a later module, this is CH1X. Is that, in fact, this one? I don't know. Oh, to open these guys up, it's really simple. There's four screws, one, two, three, four here. And then this side is where all the connections between the two halves are. So you get the screws out and then get your fingernail in there, open it up, clamshell, 
and it just falls apart like that. And then you can get access to all the stuff. And this is, in fact, the machine that I took a picture of. This, this is the, the CH1X. So if anyone wants to come take a look at these, I'll have these open on my booth. So this, this is the bottom shell with the logic board. I don't have a picture of this in my slides, I don't think. This is the top half. And I mentioned all those LCD controllers. That's all the LCD controllers. You can see I've actually stolen one off of this board to replace another machine. And then the keyboard here, which I have also stolen keys off of to fix other machines. And yes, this is one of those ones that I bought from you last year. <laughs> two, of, two of them are alive and well. One of them is with me and is getting sold this weekend. The other one is now in Switzerland. Moving these machines, moving them. Um, sorry, I'll, I'll back up here. Uh, this section is the switch mode power supply. This guy right here is a little transformer, uh, multi-type transformer used by that. Here's the main ROM. These are the footprints where the option ROM and the system bus are come through on the bottom. And then connectors for your keyboard and your LCD. These connectors are, so this is a 100 board. If you look at the 102 board, you'll see things are more or less in the same place but there's a lot more vacant PCB space because all, everything is smaller. And these connectors have changed to uh, ribbons, uh, fl flexible membrane ribbon style connectors, but it's, it's still very similar. Uh, this, this particular brand, I do not believe is Varda, but yeah, it's, it's, it's the deadly Varda battery. We will, get, we will get into the carnage caused by this battery a little bit later. <laughs> so, failure modes. First thing to know is the service manuals for these things are excellent. Truly, truly, absolutely excellent. Uh, the first roughly half of the manual is super detailed theory of operation. Like, this is how a switch mode power supply works. First power comes in here, turns on this transistor. That allows this capacitor to charge. So the current flows through this diode, turns on this other transistor. I mean, it's like really, if you've never used a switch mode power supply before, you can read exactly how it works. Uh, the second half has really nice flow chart based troubleshooting diagrams, uh, lots of schematics, timing diagrams, everything for the LCD, it's great. The problem you find is that there are a million PDFs of this thing online, and they're all terrible, except for like three. So this one right here, this is one I uploaded to archive.org that I got from another guy on, the, on Club 100. I didn't do any. I've, I've uploaded a ton of stuff to archive.org under my handle 48kram. None of it is stuff I scanned. It's all just stuff that I shepherded up there by, one, by an older member who just wanted to have it all done off of his FTP site. And this is what you get out of the service manuals. All right, here's what, what happens if memory protection doesn't function. Well, with the power on, check the VB, the battery voltage rail. It should be 5 volts. If it's not, check the power supply. With the power off, you should get between 2 and 4 volts. If it's not, check the battery and also these two diodes. Right? Real component level troubleshooting steps. Excellent. And, you know, this is what would... And it, I'm sorry, it references, like, this is the VB test point. It's labeled real nice on the silk screen on the board. Here's the VDD. Here's ground. Uh, somewhere up there is VEE, which is the minus 5 volt rail. That's right there. It's all really easy to f follow once you learn where things are on the board and you're not hunting around, where's C85? Where's C85? That'll take you about 25 minutes to find C85 because there's so many damn parts on it. But once you know it, you can really follow these, these troubleshooting diagrams. And you know, just e even more of them. Very nice. Finding finding the, the PDF of this that has the readable schematic, that's the trick. After that, it's it's fairly easy to read if you're used to reading schematic. So yeah. The now we get now we start to get into the real problems. Number one problem, the memory backup battery. Right? This is the absolute number one thing you need to worry about anytime you're dealing with one of these things. Because even though it should look like this. It usually looks like this by the time you find it, or worse, right? It, are those soldered in? They are. They are soldered in. Um, my advice is the very first thing you should be doing when you acquire one of these slabs, this applies to the NEC, the Olivetti, probably the Kyocera, just open it up, desolder it, or just clip it out. Get rid of that thing immediately. 
Even if it looks safe, it's not safe. If you can't confirm that it's been replaced in the last five to 10 years, get it out of there. Even if the voltage is right, it can still leak. Your machine can be perfectly functional, retain memory contents, and be leaking mem battery goop all over it. And it does wonderful stuff like getting underneath the solder mask, and then you have to rip up a whole bunch of the solder mask and clean that off, and then put down new, <laughs> new, new coating in replacement of the solder mask. It gets really nasty. You, you wind up having to replace all the, all the components who get, the leads get corroded, and you don't know what's going on inside the package of that component, so you just wind up having to replace everything that the corrosion touched. Um, a note on battery corrosion. People like to call, talk about battery acid damage. The batteries are actually alkali, they're base. So what you want to do is neutralize them with a mild acid. Uh, I've seen recommendations of lemon juice, uh, white vinegar. If you look up Duracell's website, they actually recommend this formula right here, one tablespoon of boric acid in one gallon of water. Um, so clean up all the battery goop. Um, replace all the corroded components. I like to use 30 gauge Kynar or wire wrap wire to replace uh, corroded traces. Uh, finish washing the board in either distilled water or you know, high grade isopropanol. You don't want to use tap water because it can have minerals that will form mineral deposits on your board. Um, and this also applies to leakage from the double A's as well. Uh, that can be equally, equally damaging. Uh, while we're on the subject of the memory batteries, the memory power rail goes through this switch. Uh, the purpose of this switch is to shut off the memory battery for storage. You always want to make sure that you have this switch in the off position when you're storing your machines for long periods of time. But it actually, it's not just the backup power switch, as it might imply, it's the whole memory power rail, in fact. So when this switch is off, even if your primary power is good, you're not powering your RAM, so your system's not going to boot. And people will get these things, turn them on, nothing works on it, can't figure out why it's dead. Did you turn the memory power on? Oh. <laughs> Although what, what, what happens more often is you find them, the memory power is already on, it's been on for the last 25 years, and the battery is completely rotten. Uh, the switch can also fail, you know, get in there, check the continuity on it, you might have to clean it. Uh, deoxid, again, very good. And a perfectly visually looks good memory battery, which is still electrically failed, can also drag down the memory power rail to the point where you're not powering your CMOS RAM chips appropriately. And you can find sometimes a machine will boot just by physically removing the memory battery, and suddenly everything works fine because that thing was acting like a short across your, your uh, memory power rail. Um, also, a good battery that's just discharged will also do the same thing. So another advice you'll see often is plug it in overnight with the memory power switched on, let, let that memory battery charge up. Again, if you find a machine in that state, it's probably a pretty good indication that that memory battery may have been neglected. I would recommend just changing it out anyway. These batteries are like $6. Uh, although some people, me included, have decided just to do away with the memory battery completely because you actually don't need it. Uh, the, mis the machine will run just fine with no memory battery installed. I've also, uh, there's been a lot of discussion on the Club 100 mailing list about using super caps in replacement for the, I think yours has a cap in it, right, Randy? I don't know. I'm, 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 pretty, sure, I'm pretty sure it was you, yours, your machine that, that, that had that, because it came to me like that when I was looking at it. And there have been some reports about that interfering with proper power up or power down under some circumstances. I don't really understand it, I'll be honest. So my recommendation is don't bother. If you, besides the fact that electrolytic capacitors can still leak, less likely to than a Varda battery, but still, I recommend if you don't wanna, if you don't wanna replace that NICAD with another NICAD like it, just run it without the memory battery at all. It works just fine. Um, obviously your data is a little less safe, so make sure you back up your data. Talk to me about Rex. Rex is awesome. And yeah. Without the memory backup battery, when you turn your machine off, right. the memory will not when you no, when you hit the power switch on the side, the memory battery is still memory contents is still protected. The, re, the way you lose memory contents is by having all primary power removed from the system. Either no no double A's and no external DC at the same time. 
uh, sim simply hitting the power switch does not drop the, the, the memory rail. That one's still there. And I found you have about three to five seconds of no power before, before your CMOS RAM chips decide to lose their data. So I, I have done this, I do this all the time, just change one battery at a time and you preserve your RAM contents. Because, yeah, three, I th any, any, any more beyond five seconds I found is, is what it takes to, to nuke it. So if you can change a battery in about two seconds, it works, you're good. So it's perfectly, pos it's perfectly possible to run these machines without the memory battery installed if you don't want to take the risk. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, yeah, I mentioned bad primary battery leakage. Oh, come on. Yeah. All right, that's a little better. I think my slide advance both forward and backward is not working right. This is actually some pieces of this one I have right here. This was all done from, from leaking double A's. You can see it has, it has completely corroded the interior of the LCD ribbon connector. It's corroded the bottom of the little RF shield on the bottom, the DC battery terminals themselves are fine. It's even corrosion has made it to the end of the DC jack. It followed this whole wire up there and corroded this entire assembly. It, it can be really, really nasty. Um, those of you who may, may have seen my posts on Twitter, my, my tagline is get the batteries out, right? <laughs> get the batteries out, absolutely. All right, more power issues. I mentioned the internal switching power supply. That is prone to failure. I've seen that plenty of times and I've heard other people reporting about it plenty of times. <clears throat> it's uh, full of all these wonderful little discrete components that have now hit the end of their, well beyond their design service life, but they're actually hitting the end of their practical service life. And uh, the capacitors, but even uh, diodes and transistors now in there are starting to fail. Um, particularly these two was, were the ones that I've been pointed to. I don't usually recommend, you know, shotgun recaps of a system. I see all these people buying whatever and the first thing they do is just recap it, right? I, I almost never recommend that, but in this case, I'm going to say everything in the power supply section, just shotgun recap it. Don't even test it, just rip it all out, new caps. After that, you can start getting into actually replacing the semiconductors and passives that have also failed. <laughs> Uh, the service manual is great. It tells you all the suspect parts. But I'm going to add on to that that every cap in that section is suspect. Technically, you need a uh, oscilloscope or at least a frequency counter to be able to verify oscillation in, in different places. This is the one, one place where you really want to have some of those advanced tools. Or you just you know keep replacing parts until you eventually rebuild the entire power supply if you don't <laughs> feel like investing in, in, in the test equipment to see if it's working. Um, I've also, while I'm on the subject of capacitors, the rest of the caps in the system I have found to be mostly okay unless they have been subjected to high heat, high humidity. The only machine that I've gotten with bad cap leakage outside the power supply was one that came to me from Key West, Florida, and every cap on that had turned into a pile of black tar. and I. I had to replace a lot of components on that board and, and it, was, it was a real chore to clean. All right, the, the RAM being broken up into eight chunks, the system has to have a way of identifying how much RAM is actually installed in the system. So it has on boot up a routine that will, it doesn't actually test all the RAM, it tests the first 256 bytes of each 8K segment to make sure that the RAM there seems eh, kind of reliable, right? And it just stops when it, when it gets to the point where this thing's not working. You know, it reads, reads a value, complements it, writes it back out, reads it again, did it stick? Yes, all right, complement it again, write it back so it's non-destructive. And that's how it works. But a failed RAM module at one point in that memory map will prevent detection of any other modules below it. So 
if your 32K machine wakes up one day suddenly thinking it's an 8K machine, now you know which it's probably that chip right the, the first option RAM bank is the first place to start looking. It's possible all three of your extra RAM banks have gone, but probably it's just that one and it just stops at that point. And it makes testing a little bit difficult because sometimes you have to go all the way down to an 8K configuration to test an individual RAM module. And of course, that base member module is always soldered in. So you wind up having to desolder. If you have a known good machine where you're, you're, you're sure it's, it's a rock solid 24K machine and you can just pop memory modules out in and out of that last option slot and use that for testing. That's, if you have more than one machine, you can work that way. I do that way. I'm, I'm not going to unsolder all my RAM. I, I, I mentioned plenty of times the memory power rail. <coughs> one thing to note is that the, the, eh, dang it. The, the VB memory power rail is somewhat less than the actual voltage of the battery because of a protection diode in there. So that just makes it even more susceptible to low battery voltage because if, you're, if your NICAD's down at two volts, your, battery, your memory power rail is only at 1.6. Oh, yeah, I, I have had problems uh, not just with the RAM chips, but also with the address decoder circuit. Um, one of the hardware differences between the 100 and 102 is with the implementation of the memory modules. You'll notice the, the memory modules on the Model 100 are a little bit more complicated. They're, they're built out of, of two chips here. And there's actually some circuitry on the back that, that generates uh, select signals between these two chips. On the 102, it's just a straight uh, 64 kilobit uh, IC that goes right in there because they've simplified the address decoding. But I have had problems with uh, the address decoding multiplexers. I actually went, went through, desoldered and replaced a whole memory chip on a machine only to find out that the problem persisted. And so I just had to move up the chain until I eventually found it in the decoder circuit that was failing to generate the select signal for that RAM bank, even though the chip was good. Well, you started the most likely thing to fail. What's more likely to fail, a CMOS RAM chip or a multiplexer? Yeah. I chose poorly. <laughs> there, there are uh, basic, or written in basic RAM test programs. You can find them on, on Club 100. I think the one to search for is ramtest.ba. And that's just, you know, a whole bunch of peaks into the right place, a whole bunch of peaks and pokes to get some idea about the confidence of the RAM in a system. Uh, I can't guarantee that it's a super thorough uh, RAM test, but I've, I've had people recommend it without too many qualifications. How am I doing on time? All right, the LCD, this is another major problem uh, that people come up with. You get a machine and it's either running blind or the LCD has weird stuff, uh, problems with it. it. It basically breaks down into three types. Uh, no image at all or insufficient contrast columns or rows out, and then sections out. Um, a, a row out would look like this. You know, you, you got this row right here. It's just blank right across the display. Uh, line, lines out, columns out. You know, you can see stuff getting, getting chopped off here. And then sections out where you have a whole square that's either black or no image. I think, it can, I think the problem can occur in either way. And those are three distinct types of failures, each one caused by a different problem. Uh, no image or poor contrast is usually ca caused by the negative 5 volt rail, which is referred to as VEE. Um, that can cause the, you can have an image, but it's way too dim, or you have no image at all. Um, again, the power supply diagnostic portion of the service manual is great on this. You know, obviously check your connectors. Also that LCD contrast pot, um, where is it? It's on the logic board and it's, and it's right here. Um, it's labeled DISP, but really what it is is a viewing angle display because it's adjusting the, the contrast voltage to the LCD panel. 
if this thing is is failing dirty whatever you won't get the proper voltage swing on it there's back on the lcd board there's a capacitor over here labeled c3 and if you measure the voltage on that it should be a nice swing from about 0.5 to 4 volts if it's not check your vee rail but if you've already serviced your power supply it's you're probably not going to run into this so you probably be more suspect if you know your VEE is good, the thing to suspect is your contrast adjustment pot. Lines or rows out. This is caused by the elastomeric connector. Uh, these are commonly known as zebra strips. And what it is, is it's this piece of flexible conductor that moves the PC board signals up to the actual electrodes embedded in the glass. And what it is, is it's a whole bunch of conductor, insulator, conductor, insulator, conductor, insulator. And so it just drops down and it's squeezed on there, uh, now you can't see from here. I have to remove the LCD module for you to see it. It's squeezed between a metal frame and the PC board. Over time, they fail. Uh, dirt gets in them. If they're subjected to too much heat, they can warp, they can flex, they just get dirty. It's really a fairly lousy way to do it. Zebra strips are still you know, state of the art for a lot of this stuff. People still make them. They're made even better now. The problem is because it's a very precision fit, they have to be precision die cut. So if I could find a manufacturer willing to take, you know, some zebra strip and cut me exactly what I need, I bet we could fix a whole lot of these problematic LCDs out there. Uh, I haven't really looked into it other than some little bit of Googling to determine that no one really wants to talk to me unless I want to be prepared to fix about 8,000 Tandy 100s. <laughs> um, but I mean, with with the way technology goes, one of these days this will be within the reach of, of home brews home brewers to actually be able to buy bulk uh, elastomeric connector and cut it to the right size. I'd love it if someone could solve that problem. Sections out, as I mentioned, that's the fault of one of these uh, Hitachi LCD controllers. You just need to take one off of a good working display, take the one off the bad display, swap it. Um, this, this note, this last bullet point here is, is a result of a spectacular failure on my part, what I learned, not to remove the old chip, the dead chip, with hot air. Cut the thing out and drag the remaining legs off the PC board, because applying the amount of heat that I needed to to get this chip off the board damaged the elastomer. So I took a perfectly good working LCD that just needed a chip swap, turned it into one that needed a chip swap and an elastomer swap, at which point I cursed and threw it away. Yeah, yeah, I was, I was very bummed to discover that. Serial communication failures. The, the UART goes through this uh, multiplex circuit here where it can go either to the RS-232 port or to the modem port. So if you have a uh, failure on one but not the other, it's not the UART, it's somewhere in those multiplexers. If they're both out, it could be the UART. I have had a machine with a dead UART that I had to replace. You can still find these, these uh, 1604 uh, chips, or 6402 chips, sorry, uh, on the internet. They're not plentiful, but you can find them. You know, They're in the $20, $25 range when you do find them. The keyboard, again, it's, it's driven by that 8155. So if you're having complete keyboard failure, you, you could be willing to suspect the PIO. More common, it, though, I think are, I'll hold up the PC board here, uh, damaged traces inside this PC board from people, you know, banging on it too much. Uh, another thing to look at is if you've had one of these machines that's been worked on by somebody, sometimes this center support here gets lost. And this is the thing that provides that extra support to keep the keyboard from flexing too much if you're working on it. If this thing has been lost or if the rubber cap from it has been lost and so it's not providing the right amount of backstop, the keyboard will flex too much and it increases the likelihood of, of breaking solder joints and traces. Um, apparently the diodes on here can fail, but it's not uh, super common. So I would, I would check those last after checking uh, mechanicals. Again, it's just one of those cases where you're just going to want to swap the, the keyboard with another unit to make, you know, is it the PIO or is it the keyboard? 
Diagnosing one of these things when you only have one really can be tricky. So that's your ultimate excuse to buy two of everything. All right, any questions so far? Mm. Oh yeah. Yeah, if if you want if you want to add RAM to it, if you have a 24K and you just want to pop in that that extra 8K module, yeah, it's going to cold start on you. Because the system is going to realize that the amount of memory has changed and it can't cope with that memory map that I showed you because now everything has to be adjusted and it's just going to go Pfft. Yeah. Um, but before, before you do anything to one of these things, just back up your RAM. Um, there's a program, there, there was a DOS program called TBAC. Uh, these things are often referred to as Model Ts. That's why you see the you know, T something, like the emulator is called Virtual T, and the TBAC is the backup program. People like to refer to these as the, the Model T of laptops. So that was a program that you ran a small basic stub, and then it just basically peaked everything out of your machine and stuffed it down the serial port. And it was actually fairly fast, as I understand. The, the much better solution, of course, is to get a Rex, and then you can back up all your memory to the flash inside the Rex. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Rex is uh, an option ROM module that <clears throat> it has um, one megabyte of flash on it, and it's set up to be bank selectable. You can load option ROM images onto this flash chip, and then in software you can choose which image is actually mapped into the address space, and because there's just a little CPLD that bank switches everything. But through some really clever software that the inventor of Rex came up with, you can actually write to this read-only slot and copy all of your RAM off to this flash in a matter of seconds and back up your whole machine to it. I have some for sale, oddly enough. <laughs> How much? Um, show price, 60 bucks. Trying not to make this a sales pitch. All right, field diagnosis. You're out in the wild, you know, maybe come over to my table, find a machine that you think you want to buy. What do you do with it? Well. Of course, you brought four double A's with you because you knew you were going to be shopping for Model 100s. So you pop the four double A's in there, you open it up, you, you check the battery compartment, make sure all the you know 20 year old batteries aren't still in there. If there are, you just kind of put it back on the table and walk away because it's going to be nothing but sadness. <laughs> turn on the memory power switch, turn on the main power, see if it boots. If it boots, you got a pretty good machine, right? Everything from there is, is going to be minor issues. Uh, if it shows any sort of, any sign of life, what you want to do is a cold start. So you hold control, brake, and then press the little reset button back here. Jab in this reset button just resets the CPU, right? Doesn't actually change anything in memory. If you want to wipe the thing to a completely clean state, you need to do this cold start procedure. This cold start procedure cures a whole bunch of ills. Anytime you think your machine is hosed, it's just not responding correctly, cold start it probably works fine. Now you lost all your RAM. But that RAM wasn't any good anyway, because that's what corrupted your machine. The RAM contents, I mean, not the physical RAM. Uh, so cold start it. You should get that menu screen I showed earlier. Check the amount of uh, RAM it reports. Great. Do some you know basic tests, 10 print, whatever. Um, you can go into basic, hit the power, type the power off command. If power shuts down, the power supply is probably pretty good. If you turn the machine on and there's Garbage all over the display, no proper text, maybe weird file names showing up, doesn't look quite right. Again, cold start, right? Um, because this, when, when the machine comes up with a completely garbled display, it could just indicate that the contents of memory are corrupted. Now, it could also indicate that you got serious RAM problems. Maybe your uh, RAM power bus isn't any good. Um, if you have a machine with nothing going on it, what you want to do is you want to check to see if it's running blind, right? The machine's operational, all the parts are fine, but the LCD is not there, probably because the VEE is dead. So you power it on, cold start, hit enter, type B-E-E-P, enter. If the thing beeps at you, it's running perfectly fine, you just can't see anything on the LCD. So now you just have to troubleshoot it from the point uh, of an LCD problem. Other than that, you got to run a machine. How long does that cold start take? Half a second. I mean, it's literally, I'm going to pick it up here. I'm going to turn it on. I'm going to hit Control, Option, Reset. 
enter, B-E-E-P, enter. That's the whole procedure. If it beeps at you, you gotta run a machine that just needs this VEE fixed. And that's probably two capacitors. So you're two capacitors away from a fully functioning machine. Are replaceable LCD screens available? Nope. Pull, we, we, if, if the LCD itself is actually problematic, your only option is to pull one from a donor machine. Uh, I don't have any way to, to fix the, the ones with lines or rows like I showed. If it's a segment out, you can just, it's just one of these chips, right? And if it's just all out contrast issues, that's just power supply. Are the chips available? I don't know. Mostly they're available from, as pulls from, from donor machines. But because each one of these machines has 10 of them, I can fix 10 machines with segments out just by, just by murdering one. So it's, you know, for, for the greater good. <laughs> Um, also, the, uh, the DC jack can fail. This, the DC jack is switched, so there's a switch inside it that switches between the AA power and the DC power. And if that switch is bad, it will prevent the AA power from reaching the internal switch mode power supply. So if it runs just on the DC, but not on the AA's, replace your DC jack. Um, these are a bit of an odd assembly because they have you know, some protection uh, diodes in, in line with them. But I'll bet you could, you could come up with a replacement. And on the 102 only, because the trap door actually shows the memory switch, uh, the last memory chip, you can actually put a meter on the, the memory power rail right there. And with, with the system off, it should read you know, some nominal NICAD value. And so you can get a pretty good indication of the state of that memory power, uh, that memory battery. This only applies to the 102 though. Um, so that's the end of the yammering. I will take questions for seven minutes. Emulators for this are available online? Like yes. Windows and uh, all, all three. Windows, Mac, Linux. Uh, it's called Virtual T. Um, and you can find it linked in the uh, member files area of club100.org. Seriously, club, club100.org. It's, it's a website that's only slightly newer than the machine itself from the looks of it. <laughs> There, there's also there, yeah, it's called Cloud T. Um, that's available at uh, Bitchin 100, another, another site dedicated to the Model 100 with a very unfortunate name. But yes, uh, JavaScript, uh, and that's the, the, the lines and rows screenshot I actually took off of that emulator. And it emulates the 100, 102, and 200? And the uh, Kyocera and the Olivetti and the NEC. Yeah. Uh, sure. Um, uh, I, I was an Atari kid. I had an Atari 400, so that was that was the the, the genesis. In fact, I still have my original Atari 400. Uh, I just love this old technology. But somewhere as a kid, I saw on TV some some kids' television program where the Model 100 was used as a prop. It was you know some other super duper computer that someone was trying to steal or use or something like that. And I thought it was just this amazing looking machine. And somehow that memory stuck with me for like 35 years to the point where I could actually buy one of these things. I figured out what it was. Three weeks ago, just for shits and giggles, I tried to figure out what that show was and I found it. It was an episode of the magical world of Walt Disney, the episode Brat Patrol. This, the, the Model 100 is a stand-in for some military decryption machine that the bad guys are trying to steal. Wow. And so that's, that was, in fact, where I first encountered the Model 100. Sufficient answer? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I've, I've, I've been into, into fixing machines for three or four years since I got back into vintage computer and collecting. And uh, I, have, I have a small but growing and diverse collection. And I, I fixed Apples, Ataris, Commodores, Tandies. When, when they brought this machine out, what, what market were they trying to... Uh, the business market. Just the business market. They, they were clearly aimed at the business market. It was, it was, they called it the micro-executive workstation. It was your portable office away from the office, right? Just like I showed in that ad, you know, it modems back to your, of course, it's going to be a Tandy business system back at your office, and it modems back to that and, 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 and uploads all your data, 
and all the manuals show how to do financial computations, forecasting, how to draw you know your profit tr tr charts. So that it was clearly uh, intended, aimed right at the the business executive. Where do you uh, get software for it? How do you load it onto the machine? Uh, Club 100 has links to lots of software repositories and the member files area where people have written and, and uploaded software. The, uh, I had to skip the slide, but since I still have time, there was, they made a thing called the portable disk drive, the TPDD, Tandy Portable Disk Drive. And you could store programs on that. Uh, three and a half inch disks are stored about 100 kilobytes. Um, you could also store programs on cassette. Lots of software for these things came on cassette. And, and you would you would load it in uh, through BASIC. Um, <clears throat> also machine language uh, programs on cassette. Nowadays, what you want to do is you want to get the programs onto a TPDD emulator. Uh, there's one called Laddie Alpha. There's one called MCOM. Uh, actually runs, I have MCOM running here on my phone. I'll have this at my booth uh, Saturday and Sunday. And I'm going to demonstrate this loading software on and off. If you want to do it, you know, from your old school Tandy 1000, you could load Desklink, which uses the serial port on that to emulate a TPDD. And so you can actually upload programs from your Tandy to your Tandy, like God intended. <laughs> <laughs> um, at, you need, you, in order to do that, you need a DOS on this. Uh, the, the predominant one is uh, TS-DOS, Traveling Software DOS. But there's also a program called Teeny, uh, just because of its size, that was a very basic uh, disk loader program. When you got the TPDD, it, it had its original startup disk, and there was a dip switch you would flip and go into BASIC and run an initialization routine where you would load a DOS off of the TPDD itself uh, via BASIC. Um, but come, come see me in the next couple of days, and I will do lots and lots of demos for that. But that's, that's, that's the way you get software now, is you have TS-DOS on your RECs, and you load it off of MCOM on your Android phone. Just get the batteries out. Get the batteries out. <laughs> So you could do assembly language programming on these yep. things back in the uh, you, the uh, there's, there's a guy in, in the club who has even written a small C library for small C85. So you can write C code for these things. But yeah, we all know assembly, right? Yeah. Okay. I think my time is up, right? All right. Thank you all.